Good morning. Thank you for t tuning in to the Governor of Newfoundland Labrador's announcement. I'm Tina Coffey with the Department of Education, and I am the moderator for today's event. Joining us today are the Honorable Tom Osborne, Minister of Education, and Brian Evans, Assistant Deputy Minister of Education. Please stand by. Our event is ready to begin. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here this morning to discuss the recent developments in regulated child care over the past few days. I am joined today by Mr. Brian Evans, Assistant Deputy Minister of K-12 and Early Childhood Education. Since Friday night, when news of Alert Level 5 was announced, the Department of Education has been working diligently with public health to ensure that regulated child care could proceed under the current conditions of the pandemic during this two-week circuit breaker, as Dr. Fitzgerald has put it. The last time we were in alert level five, regulated child care services were closed. However, we know more today than we knew back then, and our experience from the previous alert level five shows us that child care is of crucial importance to our essential workforce. That is why the Chief Medical Officer of Health recommended that regulated child care services only provide service to children of existing clients who are required to leave their home and report to their place of work effectively for essential workers. This measure has largely lessened attendance across the board. A key element in reducing risk in these child care services. While also ensuring that essential workers can continue their vital roles at this time without losing access to their child care and early education services. Since our first communication last Sunday, we've received questions and suggestions from child care operators and parents, and I want to thank everybody for reaching out and for the dialogue. Listening to and working with stakeholders has helped us find gaps and identify solutions through an evolving situation. And that work continues. We are in the process of reaching out to a broad range of child care providers to set up a meeting where we will continue these vital discussions. As the situation continues to evolve, we will continue to work with services and other stakeholders to try and address situations that evolve as the pandemic does. I would like to address a few of the more frequently asked questions that we've received over the past three days. For essential workers on needing to increase access from their normal after school care to full day child care, yesterday we announced that this would be approved for the period running to February 26th provided interested services notify their licensing authority by email or in writing. There are some conditions for this approach. Services are provided to children of child care services existing clients who are required to leave their home and report to their place of work under alert level five. While child care services are not expected to ensure school-aged children are taking part in their regular online or offline learning, these services can choose to do so if they believe they can accommodate it. It is important that I be clear on this point. In some cases, this may not be practical as services may not have, or sorry, may have children from various grades and from various different schools. Child care services may not necessarily be equipped or set up to support public Wi-Fi, nor are they equipped to assist students in using their own individual devices, troubleshooting technical issues, or logging into Google Classroom. It is important to note that school-aged children will be permitted to bring their devices to their child care services to allow for online learning. And children without their own devices will be provided with a device by their school or school district, as we have previously communicated. 
Any parent taking this route should contact their school administrator to notify them and to discuss possible arrangements for offline learning after hours. If the alert level five measures extend beyond this two week period, we will reevaluate. Obviously, we would prefer that all school aged children participate in the regular online curriculum. But this is a temporary measure that reflects the real challenges that some essential workers have raised with us. On payment for childcare, we've said previously parents who choose, um, whose children do not attend their normal regulated childcare service during this period will not be required to pay for days they do not attend. And furthermore, they will not lose their spot. I also want to make it clear that government will cover the parent fee for those child care services that remain open during this period for any child who does not attend. For any child that does attend, parents will continue to pay for their normal fees. That change took effect Monday, February 15th. Any regulated child care services that remain open or that is forced to close due to positive COVID-19 case or for testing will continue to receive their full regular funding regardless of attendance levels. Regulated child care services that choose to close voluntarily will not receive their regular funding as the intention of these measures is to ensure that child care is available for the children who need it. We've also received question as to whether families who work from home are deemed essential and can send their children to child care. To that question, I will reiterate that the Chief Medical Officer of Health is encouraging child care operators to limit attendance for the children of parents who must leave their home and report to their workplace. Following this recommendation will help lessen attendance thus reducing risk. We understand that reduced attendance may not be convenient in all cases. However, it is the guidance of Dr. Fitzgerald and her team. I'm asking for understanding and understanding for child care operators in the event that they have to turn you away in this situation. It is for the safety of children at the centers, the early child care educators, and staff. These measures will help reduce the spread while offering the available spaces to the parents of those who must report to work. I also received a question as to what happens if all parents claim to be essential and a child care service is full. We believe that this is highly unlikely and we've already heard that most services are operating well below capacity. However, if a child care service finds themselves in that situation, they should advise the Department of Education and we will consult with public health. The Chief Medical Officer of Health and Public Health have not required any changes to the current operational policies or protocols in child care services, such as sanitizing, cohorting, masking, meals, etc. Therefore, the current operational policies of COVID-19 should continue to be followed because attendance will be significantly reduced during alert level five. Our understanding is the current protocols are appropriate. The final point I'll make before passing questions over to the media is the questions that we've received around unregulated child care services. As it says right in the name, the province does not have any oversight into or regulation applying to these child care services. We've made significant strides in recent years to reduce perceived barriers to services becoming regulated and have available a grant for family child care providers wishing to become regulated to address some of the costs. Since the introduction of the $25 a day child care, we now have approximately 80% of the entire regulated child care industry on the operating grant program. 
However, there are some services that still choose to remain outside this regulatory framework, and that is their decision. What I will say is that all unregulated childcare services should be following the same public health advice as their regulated counterparts, as the intention of this service is to ensure the health and safety of children. However, because unregulated childcare does not operate as a licensed or approved service, under our legislation, we have no oversight of the services offered and they are not entitled to compensation for government for children not attending. It would be inappropriate to use public funding to compensate services where there is no public oversight. In closing, I will say this, that while there is no perfect solution to childcare in this pandemic, we continue to work with stakeholders on finding solutions. We don't have all the answers. What we do have is a commitment to support families through this challenging time. As issues emerge, we will work to identify options to overcome them. With that, Tina, I will ask that you open the lines to the media for questions. Thank you, Minister. For the benefit of our speakers, there are four reporters registered for today's announcement. The question and answer session will be conducted in one round where each reporter will have the opportunity to ask two questions. Following this, I will ask each reporter if they have any final questions. Our first questions are from Diane Crocker, Western Star. Please go ahead. Good morning, Minister. Uh, just, I guess, why not keep places like, uh, you know, a school setting or, you know, daycare set like College of North Atlantic or Mon open uh, and use them for essential workers? Uh, we could certainly look at that option. Uh, it is something we are guided by the, uh, the guidelines and, and advice and protocols put forward by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. One of the concerns was not introducing uh, new children into existing cohorts. Um, you know, so we will uh, take that under advisement. We'll look at that uh, as a potential option, but anything we do is in consultation with and uh, based on the guidance from public health. Okay, and just the second question for you then, is you talk about you know planning and you know we went through this back in March. Uh, some would say that it still doesn't seem like you're ready for it. What do you say to those people who think that not enough planning has taken place? Uh, there were plans in place, but the best laid plans have to be tested against reality. And the reality is uh, the, uh, the variant, uh, the speed at which the, uh, the pandemic spread as a result of the variant uh, most recently. And before we do anything, uh, even with plans that are made and, and put in place, there are no concrete answers with an evolving situation. Uh, we must and we do work with and consult with uh, public health and the Chief Medical Officer of Health. So before we announce any plans, while they may be put in place and, and, and made, those plans have to evolve as the situation evolves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Minister. Our next questions are from Brian Callahan, VOCM. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Minister Osborne, uh, it sounds to me, though, uh, so from what you've said, that the uh, the people who are essential workers and they work from home are out of luck when it comes to this. Is that correct? The Chief Medical Officer of Health, uh, Brian, um, I will say the Chief Medical Officer of Health has said that it is for people who must report to work. Uh, we have to follow those guidelines, and I think the the level of trust the public have uh, in uh, Dr. Fitzgerald is warranted. She has proven herself. Um, she has the ability uh, to look at this and to, uh, to give the best advice possible, and we accept that advice. Uh, the advice is that uh, child care at early learning and child care uh, operations are for uh, essential workers that have to report to work. It seems that it might be in the semantics in the wording, though, because report to work could be reporting to work online, could it not? Uh, let me be clear. Report to their workplace. Okay. 
So that means leaving the house and therefore no care for the child. Correct. And so, okay, so thanks for that. And a little bit more of a, a higher level general question. You know, I'm getting also uh, questions regarding why elementary kids, um, students, uh, parents that I know have 90 minutes of instruction, but uh, as soon as you strike grade seven, it's full day. So it, can you just clarify, you know, I mean, is, why is such a disparity there just from that one grade, six to seven? Obviously, there needs to be more instruction at the higher grades. Um, you know, it's important uh, that, uh, you know, as you proceed through the grades, there's more instruction time, there's a, a more structured day. Um, it's a very valid question, Brian, but, you know, the reality is um, our, our higher grades are more intense, uh, require more face-to-face um, -face instruction with the educators. And, and that's the reason the English School District has set it up this way. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Brian. Our next questions are from Cecil here at CBC News. Um, good morning, Minister and Mr. Evans. Uh, just, just a quick question about uh, who decides what and when. Minister, I noticed in the initial press release uh, that you're recommending uh, that, that the daycare centers uh, make uh, uh, the centers available. So I don't want to get too hung up on the word recommend, but uh, the question then becomes, is it the daycare that decides if a child can attend? Um, Whose decision is it? Who does, who does one apply to? Early learning and child care operations are private businesses. Um, the Department of Education does not have the ability to dictate who does or does not attend. Uh, that would be, uh, as we saw with the previous pandemic, under public health orders, uh, we can be more stringent. The guidance we have uh, today from public health is that it is uh, children of essential workers that must report to their workplace. Um, and, um, uh, you know, so we can recommend to the early learning and child care centers, um, you know, if changes are needed, uh, we'll take the guidance from public health. Uh, but we anticipate that early learning and child care centers will follow the, the protocols and the, uh, the recommendations of public health. Mm -hmm. so, so the last time, we'll call it, say, last spring, it was a different health order, and, and, and that was the difference because wasn't the application process on who could attend? Wasn't that different? Uh, the last time uh, the public health order was 70% uh, capacity. This time it is children of essential workers who must return to work or report to the workplace. Uh, so the difference being, um, I guess it's, it's the variant and based on uh, the guidance of public health, and they, they understand the epidemiology and they understand uh, why they make re these recommendations, we follow the recommendations. So the difference between the last time at 70% capacity and this time is that you can't be uh, stringent in putting a capacity percentage in place because we don't know how many of the children are uh, of uh, parents of essential workers that must report to the workplace. Uh, by that very nature, we anticipate that the num numbers would be significantly lower than 70%. If there are cases where an operation um, sees that the, the capacity, um, you know, that their capacity uh, is challenging, uh, we ask them to work with the district office and with the Department of Education, uh, and we'll work with them. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Our next question are from Jody Cook in TV News. Good morning. On the attendance issue, um, I'm wondering if there is, just for the aid of those who are running these regulated child cares, is there some sort of a formula for them to know approximately how many and what is maxed out by way of, of children in their care? Um, I'll ask uh, Brian Evans to elaborate on, on my answer, but, you know, if... Across the board, we are seeing reduced numbers across the province. We do not anticipate um, that there will be um, challenges, or if there are, certainly we don't anticipate uh, significant. 
in terms of uh, the capacity numbers at an early learning and child care center. Um, by its very nature, the children of essential workers who must return or report to their workplace, uh, we would anticipate that the numbers across the board would be significantly lower. Uh, Brian, can you elaborate? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, right now, there's no change to existing ratios in child care centers and family child care homes uh, that's currently under the legislation. Those ratios uh, would certainly depend on the size of the center, the size of the service, uh, but typically right now they are operating under the current ratios. And as the minister said, what we are certainly hearing, while we don't have firm numbers, is that numbers are been significantly reduced. Parents are keeping their children home and only bringing those of children that are essential workers. Okay, thank you. And has the province, uh, understanding that we don't necessarily have an end date on this, we do have a two-week circuit breaker, but it could go longer, is there an anticipated cost associated with this that has been uh, worked out? Um, I'll be able to give you, you know, more concrete numbers on, on the anticipated cost once we get through this. At this particular stage, um, it's certainly our hope uh, that this uh, situation will be weeks versus the previous situation, which was months. Uh, uh, public health, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, um, the province in general are more equipped to deal um, with the challenges of the pandemic today than we were uh, the first go round. Um, so we anticipate that this will be weeks. It's certainly my hope personally uh, that uh, public health are successful in, um, uh, you know, with their with their um, um, getting this under control and ensuring uh, that the uh, contact tracing is done uh, effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. For our final round, I will go through the registered media once where there will be an opportunity for one question each time your name is called. Uh, Diane Cracker, Western Star, do you have a final question? Yes. In terms of when you're talking about, I guess, the ages uh, that child care providers are allowed to have in their home, I know there's a breakdown. They can have certain, uh, you know, number of, you know, under you know, two or whatever. Um, what if they're not, like, licensed now to take school-age children, but they don't have the numbers of the younger ages in their facilities, can they open themselves up to take in new children if there's a parent out there that's like totally lost without childcare? Because I know there are some parents who work flexible schedules to cover the hours of, within school so they don't need after school childcare, uh, but now they'll need childcare during the day. Uh, the guidance from public health is that they do not want new children introduced to an early learning and child care operation. Um, the question you posed is what if there are no children show up? Uh, you know, so we can take that under advisement, but they don't want, uh, public health does not want mixing of cohorts. So the children uh, of um, uh, child care centers that are current clients uh, in the after school program, because they're already part of that cohort, uh, they're already clients, uh, can be extended to the full day. In a situation as you've outlined, uh, should we find that an operation has no children attend, um, you know, we, we can certainly look into that and seek guidance from public health. Thank, Thank you, Diane. You very much. Brian Callahan, BOCM, do you have a final question? Just looking for, I want to make sure this was covered um, rather than lose it after the call. The, the coverage for families that have to stay home or kids that uh, uh, can't go and uh, they won't lose their spot and they'll also be compensated or they won't uh, be penalized for that. Um, is that a full coverage of their fees for the days that they don't attend or is it partial? No, the, uh, the child care operations um, will receive their full regular payment from government. So a parent who um, keeps their children from the center, uh, it, for, you know, the, the, the parent will not be penalized uh, or have to pay the fee uh, and will not lose their spot. Thank yep. you, Brian. Thank you. Please here, CBC News, do you have a final question? Uh, just a quick one, uh, looking for numbers. Uh, you mentioned, Minister, 80% uh, of regulated uh, daycare centers are in uh, under the grant program. How many children are we talking about here? Do you know? 
Uh, Brian, do you have that Ballpark. number? Yeah, in total, um, we've got approximately 8,000 uh, regulated child care spaces in the province between family child care homes and, and family, uh, family child care services centers. Okay, 8,000 under the regulated uh, program. Okay. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Sarah. Uh, Jody Cook, NTV News. Do you have a final question? Yes, thanks. Um, <clears throat> just a point of clarification. I'm wondering if you could reiterate. So we had received some information from people working in unregulated child care as uh, early, child, early childhood ed educators. And they have indicated that they were instructed to continue to operate as though they were in alert level two. In this news conference this morning, you've said that they should be following the same advice. So can you just reiterate that messaging? And I want to make sure I have that right. Uh, so I'll ask Brian to expand on, on the answer that I provide. But um, the protocols that have to be followed um, in terms of sanitizing, hand sanitizing, masks, uh, meals, and, and other protocols must be followed. Um, the uh, the Chief Medical Officer of Health and Public Health have not changed those protocols. Um, while they've uh, put in place the, the guidelines that it, uh, child care is for the, the children of essential workers that report to work, uh, report to the workplace, um, the, the other protocols uh, that are in place must be followed. So while we don't regulate uh, unregulated child care, we have no uh, oversight over them. Uh, there's no inspections uh, of those. We are asking and expecting uh, that they would follow the same protocols. Brian? Yeah, yes, and I guess to be clear, the, the alert level two child care policies are, are specific and must be adhered to for the regulated sector. Certainly if the unregulated sector chooses to uh, utilize those recommendations and protocols are freely available on the Department of Education's website, um, I think just from a pure public health messaging, and I'm only echoing what certainly Dr. Fitzgerald would have said, just a general advice for the unregulated sector would be that uh, to only accept uh, children of essential workers. And, uh, but again, they're for certainly free to use regulated policies under Alert Level 2 for our regulated child care sector. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, everyone. Our time has ended. Minister, do you have any final comments? Well, just to uh, acknowledge the work of our early learning and child care uh, educators, the staff and the centers. Um, you know, the, as I've said in, in uh, yesterday's briefing, um, they've put our children uh, first and foremost, um, and I want to thank them for that. Uh, I know that this is an anxious time for everybody, uh, including our early learning and child care educators and, and our centers and operations, uh, home-based operations. Um, just want to encourage everybody to follow the guidelines and the protocols of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Um, you know, this, uh, uh, if you know of anybody uh, who needs an uplift, reach out, because these can be anxious times. And I wish everybody well. Uh, please stay safe. Thank you, Minister. Take care, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Our smartphones. We use them to keep in touch, to play, and to work. Now, your smartphone can help you limit the spread of COVID-19. Someone can have COVID-19 and not know it. They can spread the disease before they have any symptoms. The Government of Canada has developed an app that will let you know if you may have been in contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. The COVID Alert app creates a random code so that no one will know your name or your location. The app uses Bluetooth to exchange random codes with nearby phones. The code is a randomly generated string of digits and letters that changes every five minutes so it cannot be used to identify you. The app does not have access to your name or address or your phone's contacts, your location or your health information. If someone you've encountered later tests positive for COVID-19 and uploads to the app a one-time key they received from their healthcare authority, you'll be notified that you may have been exposed. If you test positive for COVID-19, you can upload your one-time key from your healthcare authority. The app will then notify the people you've encountered without revealing your identity. You can then take steps to limit the spread of the disease. If you know you've been exposed, you should contact your local public health authority and follow their instructions. Using the app is one more thing we can all do to help limit the spread of COVID-19.
in addition to washing our hands, keeping two meters apart, and wearing a non-medical mask or face covering when it's difficult to maintain physical distancing. You can do your part by downloading the app today and helping others use it too. The more people who use the app, the better we can contain COVID-19. Help protect yourself and your community. Download the COVID Alert app to help limit the spread of COVID-19. Go to the App Store or Google Play. Find out more at canada.ca slash coronavirus. A message from the Government of Canada.